20 years ago to this day, Radiohead took one of the biggest left turns in music history, completely reinventing themselves, stepping away from rock music and releasing one of the most critically acclaimed and beloved electronica and experimental rock albums of all time. This album was Kid A. However, despite the almost universal adoration for the album now, it completely divided audiences upon release. Many criticised the album for its lack of guitar, obscured vocals, unconventional song structures and many believed it to be pretentious, clumsy and dated compared to the albums it was inspired by. The hatred towards the switch away from rock music has been likened to Bob Dylan's controversial move towards rock music. Rob Sheffield of Rolling Stone wrote, there's no controversy over Kid A anymore. Nobody admits that they hated Kid A at the time. Nobody wants to be the clod who didn't get it. Over the next however long this video is, I'm going to completely dive into this album, review every song, talk about all the sounds and influences of the album, and make what is part documentary and part review. Because with an album as special as this, a short review isn't quite enough. This is Kid A. Stop. Radiohead's rise to fame was very gradual throughout the 90s. Although debut album Pablo Honey was a small success, it was considered incredibly derivative and too similar to many of the band's grunge-based contemporaries. Although their follow-up The Benz was far more successful and is still considered to be one of the band's best albums, it wasn't until their third album, 1997's OK Computer, that the band became one of the most celebrated and critically acclaimed bands of the 90s. It was praised for stepping away from the grunge and Britpop inspired sound of their predecessors in favour of a melancholic, politically charged alt-rock sound. It debuted at number one on the UK album charts and would go on to sell four and a half million copies worldwide and be considered one of the greatest rock albums ever made. The huge success of the album led to an extensive touring and promotion cycle which led the band to feel completely drained and left afraid of having to repeat a similar cycle ever again. During the album cycle, frontman Tom York started writing basic ideas for the songs including the song How To Disappear Completely which the band even began playing in 1998. <laughs> However, he began suffering from writer's block and felt unable to finish writing songs on guitar. He felt completely disillusioned by rock music believing the genre had run its course. As far as we were concerned, the you know, being even being called a rock band was a bit of a, a nightmare really. Why? Because it sucks. Fucking rock music sucks, man. I hate it. I'm suck. just so fucking bored of it. I hate it. It's a fucking waste of time. It's like, it's not really the music. It's not, it's not sitting on a stage playing guitar um, or drums and singing. That, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is all the mythology that goes with it. I have a real fucking problem with that. I have a real problem with the idea that you have to tour yourselves stupid and you know do certain things and talk to certain people and this is the way you you know i just I totally snapped had enough of it Although guitarist Ed O'Brien hoped the band's fourth album would comprise of snappy, melodic guitar songs, Tom told Q Magazine there was no chance of the album sounding like that. I'd completely had it with melody, I just wanted rhythm. All melodies to me were pure embarrassment. He believed that many new acts coming out were imitating Radiohead and started to believe that his music had become part of a constant background noise he described as fridge buzz. Previously, he had been a DJ and was part of a techno band during his stay at Exeter University, which led him to approached the world of electronic music. He began listening almost exclusively to the electronic music of Warp Records artists such as Aphex Twin and Orteca. He felt that writing the music in this style would allow him to use his voice more like an instrument and that it could allow Radiohead to write less traditional music. Tom decided to buy a house in Cornwall where he spent his time walking the cliffs and drawing, as well as restricting his musical activity to playing the grand piano he had recently bought. He described himself as a shit piano player but he got into that computer and sims because he had no clue how any of them worked and found it much more fascinating to work with. Yeah. 
The band started working on Kid A in Paris in January 1999 with OK Computer producer Nigel Godrich. Tom still faced writer's block and still had very few songs complete, many of which considered them nothing more than small sounds or rhythms. The band found themselves struggling with the new direction and Johnny and Colin Green were both feared that the album would become gratuitous and awful nonsense. Godrich also didn't understand why if they had a strength in one thing they would do something else instead. There was conflict within the band because not everyone would be playing on each song. O'Brien then began using sustain units which allowed guitar notes to be sustained infinitely. Combined with this as well as looping and delay effects he created synthesizer like sounds on his guitar. The band experimented with loads of different electronic instruments including modulus synths, the Ondes Martinot and they also used software such as Pro Tools and Cubase to edit and manipulate their recordings. In March the band moved to Medley Studios in Copenhagen. These sessions produced about 50 reels of tape each containing 15 minutes of music. The following month they resumed recording in a Gloucestershire mansion. As the band had a lack of deadline and several incomplete ideas causing them to lose focus they agreed they would break up if they couldn't agree on an album worth releasing. In July O'Brien began keeping an online diary about the recording sessions and that same month they moved to a new studio in Oxford where they would begin broadcasting webcasts known as Amateur Night which featured a DJ set interspliced with new music. By the end of 1999 six songs were complete. The band struggled to use electronic instruments and techniques collaboratively so in January 2000 Godrich split the band up into small experimental workshops to experiment with the synths and electronic sounds and create something that they could use. Well, Nigel was funny. Nigel was really good because he said that in uh, Nigel, Nigel Godrich produced it. He he, we had this thing at the beginning of the year, and Johnny apparently didn't enjoy this two weeks. But Nigel was said like, we'd completed some songs and we hadn't completed others, and we were starting. And rather than you know, we'd had the break after Christmas. He said, all right, we're gonna we're gonna let's split up into two groups, and we had two weeks of totally ex i mean it was real sort of workshop experimental stuff mm. and it kind of i think we got a lot of that stuff out of our system you know we weren't allowed to pick that the, the, the nigel said the rules were nobody was allowed to play drums nobody was allowed to pick up a guitar the only things that the only thing that could be used were sort of acoustic uh, were uh, electronic you know computers synths etc etc and you know out of all of that i you know there was sort of probably it was really good fun 20 percent of it was was good and the eight, other 80 percent of it was utter rubbish being a student or whatever, yeah exactly it's it? like so yeah. afterwards we went off for a pint of snake bite yeah. <laughs> socialist worker <laughs> <laughs> though the experiment didn't create any songs it helped convince the band of the new direction the album's influences came from all over the place rather than just electronic music crowd rock bands such as can jazz musicians such as Charles Mingus, Alice Coltrane and Miles Davies, the abstract hip-hop from the Mo Wax label which included Black Alicious and DJ Crush, Bjork's 1997 album Homogenic as well as the Talking Heads 1980 album Remain in Light were considered huge influences on the album's sound. We were all kind of really heavily obsessed, ever since OK Computer we've been heavily obsessed by Remain in Light, Talking Heads album, and the way that they did that and, and the, uh, the sort of emotions that go with that record that are kind of like not, uh, not, just not got the same like most emotional range as any other Talking Heads record. It's like totally out from, from over there somewhere. And the other thing was the way that David Byrne was writing the lyrics on that, because he went to that record with no, he had like notes and no songs, no songs, just like, Start a rhythm. Here's a riff. Da 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 da. Let's keep going. I guess. I, I guess what I what I what I admired in the remaining light thing is that everything is essentially fragments because he's taking things from notebooks. And so what I sort of went off and tried to do when 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 I couldn't with with the writer's block thing was like just basically have all the things that didn't work and 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 sort of started stop. S s stopped uh, throwing them away, which is what I'd been doing before, like screwing them up, and and keeping them and cutting them up and putting them in this top hat and pulling them out. And that was really cool because what it did was that I managed to preserve whatever emotions were it, uh, in the in in the original writing of the words, but in a way that it's like not. I'm not trying to 
emote. It's just part of what's going on. So like, to, to, so like, they're not printing the words on this record because the words are just part of what's going on. Many of the lyrics were written by cutting up words and phrases and assembling them at random, combining cliches and banal observations with violent imagery. On Kid A, Tom explores the pressure put on him by the media and how they manipulated his public image to make him into something he wasn't. Although much of the album's lyrics were described by Tom as gibberish, they come together to describe how we're all serving a manipulative and destructive higher power. These lyrics are placed behind very desolate and dark musical landscapes, something that is paralleled by the cold and empty visuals shown in the album's artwork. Johnny Greenwood stated that he liked combining older technology with newer technology, hence the usage of the Ondes Martin not, an early electronic instrument from the late 1920s. In an interview with The Independent, he stated that the Ondes Martinot is 20s technology, the vocoder is 60s slash 70s technology, and the string quartet is an even older idea. Putting them all together is what I'm most excited about. The band also sought to combine electronic manipulations with jam sessions inspired by Can. By the end of the recording, the band had completed over 20 songs, with a supposed other 20 that were incomplete, which included Nude, Burn the Witch, and True Love Waits, which would be released on In Rainbows and The Moonshape Pool, respectively. Deciding the tracklist for the album supposedly caused many arguments between the band, which even caused them to come close to breaking up. However, they finally decided on 10 tracks for the record, and on October 2nd, 2000, it was released upon the world. The first song written on this piano was the opening song to the album, Everything in Its Right Place, a particularly bare song basing almost entirely of a Prophet 5 synthesizer, drum machine, and Tom's vocals processed in Pro Tools using the scrubbing tool. The song combines its unconventional time signature of 10-4, represented in the guitar and keyboard transcript as alternating between 4-4 and 6-4, to a house-inspired groove as well as an unusual chord progression using dissonant harmonies to create an omni Phil. After recording the song, Greenwood considered it to be the turning point for the album and felt that everything else came after it. I think the song Everything in Its Right Place was important because unlike with OK Computer, our last record, uh, we were happy to leave parts of it empty. I think in the past we've been too scared to leave sounds exposed and, and also have too much space around them and we've been guilty of layering on top of what's 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 a very good song or a very good sound and, and, and hiding it, camouflaging it in case it's not good enough. And everything that's the right place is one of the first songs that we've actually realised is great, even though it's so sparse. So that was a very important song. And it also dictated how we sequenced the record because we knew it had to be the first song and everything just followed after it. The song consistently construes your expectations for resolution and serves almost as an overture for the album, implementing many themes that are later on explored. Tonally, the song presents the keyboard and vocals as almost battling to determine the key of the track, which creates an almost disharmonic sound throughout. Tom wrote the song about the depression he felt while touring OK Computer, especially a breakdown he had after their gig at the NEC in Birmingham, where he could not speak after getting off stage. So come on then, how traumatic was it making the album compared to previous Radiohead LPs? I think it was more down to the fact that the, the traumatic bit was, was in a way was, was um, having to go away and see it from the outside. Mm. So you, like in a way, we all had to get to the point where Radiohead was, was, was this uh, meaningless thing uh, uh, which we sort of didn't really hold any faith in or you know it was just this thing that we'd been involved in mm. um so you just have to break it up before putting it back together yeah or something. that's mm. that's kind of what i was mm. yeah that's what i kind of mean um because uh i mean for me personally it was like uh i really there wasn't really ever a time throughout the whole thing where i wanted to sort of pack it up because to me it's sort of like we'd spent so much time together and we were really close and we understood what we were doing. Um, we, underst we understood each other sort of musically really. Um, so it was like it didn't make any sense to blow it out. But at the same time, everything that we'd done didn't seem to 
float my boats anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the track is one of the band's most ethereal and ominous songs with its almost hymn sounding dreamscape of ambience. It's a song that lacks the crescendos of many Radiohead songs and instead keeps its almost creepy atmosphere right until it ends. Tom's lyrics are surreal, hypnotic and incredibly beautiful. The track is one of the best album openers in music history, letting the audience know from the get go that this is a complete reinvention. The track really feels like a rebirth and it's entrancing, glitchy yet minimalist sound never loses any of its power no matter how many times you listen to it. This then leads into the album's title track, an incredibly ambient track featuring heavily processed vocals created using a ring modulator to make Tom sound robotic. Tom didn't sing any melody at all, instead he spoke into the microphone and Johnny created a vocoded melody. With regards to Tom, I suppose, I think he's obviously someone who he, he's very into the, the fine voice that he's, he has. He, at the same time, you know, he's always looking for new ways to try, you know, and express different persona and, 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 and the way of doing that is by, by treating the voice, you know, and uh, I, I don't want to track mm. Kid A. Kid A was the one that really struck me, uh, where yeah. it does all sorts of things. Well, that, that, was, that was a vocoder whose notes he sang through a, a vocoder and the notes were triggered by Fionn Martineau that you were playing at the same time as he was singing, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. It's pretty Trans mad. The song Kid A was written by Johnny, and all I was doing was was talking through what Johnny was playing. Why? Why did you um, distort and? Um, uh, uh, it was very. It was. It was basically um, <laughs> something. I, I'm not precious about the way my voice sounds at all. I, I kind of had a problem with my own voice, um, and hearing people like myself on the radio made me not want to sound like me uh, and I would do anything frankly to not sound like me but yet still you know be able to write and sing. Heavily inspired by Orteca, the xylophone sounding keyboards, blending of drum machines and real drums create this unnerving and expansive track that feels like you're gliding through the album cover's mountains. The inception of the track lies in a small piece of music Tom programmed on a 505 sequencer. He then wrote the lyrics by splicing together random phrases that he had written. There are certain words and phrases which you pick out of a song, but heads on sticks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Quite eerie. Out of the hat, that in was. In context. Was it? Mm. Just plucks out of the hat. No, I've got one of them hats, you know, top hats. Oh, really? Pulling it out of the top. I, I had, um, uh, the other thing that I mentioned, I, I mean, I had a, essentially a writer's block for two years, and all the stuff that, that, that um, uh, was in the writer's block that I didn't actually throw away in, in it instantly was, was, was put into this top hat. And, um, Whenever we were jamming or doing stuff in the studio, I didn't know what to sing, I would pull stuff out of the hat. The song is supposedly about the possibilities and dangers of technology and is about Tom's vision of the first cloned baby, hence the crying sounds towards the end of the song. Much of the album questions what it's like to be a human being in a world where every relationship is mediated by technology. Its gentle sound creates an almost childlike feeling which is complemented by lyrics that easily could have been taken from a children's storybook. The track is almost like this beautiful weird lullaby. It's haunting and complex but a beautiful piece of dream dreamlike ambience. It's followed by the track The National Anthem, a contrasting, loud and explosive free jazz track. The song is based around a repetitive bass line written by Tom when he was 16. The song had been previously worked on multiple times, including during the OK Computer sessions with the intention to make it a B-side. National Anthem, we actually started recording that song uh, to over two years ago. After the last UK tour, we went in and we were finishing off a B-side and the rhythm track for the National Anthem was actually hatched then. Um, and it was, you know, at the time it wasn't really working, so we left it for two years, came back to it and something started to gel there, really. I you know? thought it, w it, was, it was left because your drums were so good on it. Oh, why did you know? <laughs> I mean, that, <laughs> that we didn't, we couldn't do what it justice. What are you asked today? <laughs> I, I, I feel some, some big favour coming. <laughs> I just love your drums. <laughs> <laughs> However, Greenwood believed that the song was too good to be a B-side and that it needed more work. Greenwood added the Ondes Martinot, an early theremin-like electronic instrument, as well as using samples from radio stations. It was, it was basically written around a very old song, a bass line from about 10 years ago. 
Tom Demo the song on the four track when we were all at school when he was about 16 or 17. Oh my gosh. So, around like a boss Dr. Rhythm drum machine and a uh, and, uh, sort of guitar fuzz bass line. And um, then they cut um, National Anthem and decided it was too good to use as a B-side for OK Computer singles. So it sat on the shelf for another two years. And then Johnny added all this amazing stuff with the Ond Martineau and uh, found sounds on the radio station, including the orchestra at the end, which is where the National Anthem title comes from, because it sounds like so it wasn't originally called National Anthem, it was called Everyone. Tom's vocals were also processed through a ring modulator once again. The band also incorporated a brass section inspired by the controlled chaos of Charles Mingus's 1964 Town Hall concert album. The free jazz section of the song was described as sounding like a brass band marching into a brick wall and was conducted by Greenwood and Tom to sound like a traffic jam. Tom, who had no previous experience in conducting, reportedly jumped up and down so much during the conducting that he broke his foot. Well, it started with, with Tom saying this this track should really sound like by the end it, it should it should turn in, into a Charlie Mingus track and Tom has these ideas quite often and sometimes they're best ignored and sometimes they're genius and he's he's completely right and we pretty much just got a brass section into the room um, and I scored out the rough tune and Tom and I stood in front of them conducting sort of I say conducting it, it wasn't Simon Rattle it was more just jumping up and down when we wanted it to be louder and faster and calming them down at certain points you know, I'm sure it looks ridiculous, but it sounded, I mean, it sounds, sounds on tape pretty good. The song expresses the theme of alienation through irony. The song articulates the terror felt by many, the opposite of what a national anthem generally is made to do. In his book Radiohead, a visual documentary, Tim Footman describes the song as threatening music, harnessing the incendiary rage of free jazz to what's supposed to be a pop song. The song is one of the most euphoric blasts of energy and anger ever put into a Radiohead song, swapping heavily distorted guitars and Tom screaming with a discordant horn section and Tom's processed wail. It's one of the most exciting pieces of music on Kid A with its loose, noisy scream-like jam session sound which distills everything about the band into a six-minute blast of evocative emotion. The next track, the classical-inspired How to Disappear Completely, is another complete contrast to its predecessor. Although the main bulk of the song was performed using acoustic guitar and vocals, there is also a string section composed by Greenwood and performed by the Orchestra of St. John's and recorded in Dorchester Abbey. The orchestration scene on this track was inspired by Polish composer Krzysztof Penderecki and the vocals and songwriting was inspired by singer-songwriter Scott Walker, who previously influenced the band's 1993 hit Creep. The string sections are incredibly discordant and contain a flat high B note that creates a dissonant sound above the alternating D major and F sharp minor chords. Uh, one piece that um, that struck me having the on Martineau is how to disappear completely. There's, there's a kind of very high line that moves above the song. Was it Martineau? Yeah, that, I mean, that was the string parts were written originally with an on Martineau, just multi-tracking it and, and playing one part at a time. And eventually we, we did replace it with real strings, but, but parts of it, you can still hear the Martinez going on. It's quite a strange um, orchestration, because it seems to sort of like float over the top of the song in a kind was, of disembodied way. Well, I mean, Johnny probably didn't have such a good time, but he um, scored the strings and played the Martineau live didn't you, with, with, with the orchestra of St John's... But I played it very, very badly out of tune. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> St John's Smith Square at Dorchester Abbey, you know, and the Thames, and it was freezing winter. Was it was it February? And, uh, and Nigel, our producer, took his, his Apple G3 and hard drive in and some microphones and no tape and recorded the orchestra and, and Johnny playing along on the On Martineau. The song is structurally and lyrically one of the only like standard pop based songs on the album and it describes a dreamlike vision that contrasts the more claustrophobic content of the national anthem. The chorus of the song that features the words I'm not here, this isn't happening stems from a mantra given to Tom by REM vocalist Michael Stipe. The song was written in late 1990 
1997 and was soundchecked during some shows as shown in a documentary Meeting People Is Easy. In her book Radiohead and the Resistant Concept album, Marianne Tatum Letts describes the song as serving the protagonist of the album's death and that all songs following it serve as essentially being the afterlife. The protagonist inner demons were personified in the sound's sporadic tonal textures whereas the softer and more straightforward sound of Disappear Completely shows his demons completely taking over. The song was another one written about Tom's feelings on the OK Computer Tour. Is it written about a certain gig or a certain time? Yeah, it was. What was that gig we did? The RDS. Mm. The biggest gig we'd done, it was the week before we did, it was in 97, the week before we did Glastonbury, wasn't right. it? Yep. And it was like the seventh gig of, you know, OK Computer. And the first gig of OK Computer, we were in front of 400 people in Lisbon. Right. We couldn't even sell out the tickets in this little club. <laughs> Two weeks later, we're in, we're in Ireland in front of 38,000 mad Irish fans. And it was, well, you, I mean, I always, I mean, I, I'm sure it must really annoy you, but you're like the you know the pie piper of dublin whenever you're in you suddenly you know you see you can tell where you are in dublin because there's all these you know all these people following you it's like oh tom must be around the corner because there's this like queue of people maybe the music is one that doesn't have much progression to it and is just based around the guitar, bass, string and drum sound with a few synth sounds here and there, but it's one where Tom's lyrics and vocals are really what makes it an engaging, beautiful and heartbreaking listen that is one of the most emotionally poignant songs the band has ever written. The narrative Tatum Letts described is then followed in the next track, Tree Fingers, a desolate ambient song that sounds like the protagonist descending into the afterlife. The track was written by Tom using chords Ed had played on his guitar and processing and rearranging them digitally. All the sounds on the track were created using guitar sounds played through effect pedals and processors and it creates a beautiful, expansive and huge texture. When asked in an interview with MC2 how the track was made, Ed O'Brien stated, Tree Fingers is an ethereal, spacey song built from guitar loops. I'm not taking any credit for it because Tom arranged it. He recorded me playing the guitar for 10 minutes, then loaded parts into a sampler, played bits on his keyboard and made sense of it. It doesn't sound like a guitar, which is great. The song appeared on Kid A in a shortened form, but a longer version was released in 2020 and appeared on the soundtrack for Christopher Nolan's movie Memento. <laughs> After this, the protagonist is given a second chance of life, leading into the song Optimistic, which would be one of the few songs on the album to receive radio play due to its much more straightforward rock sound reminiscent of much of OK Computer. Many of the album's most critical reviewers considered this to be one of the album's only high points. The first verse of the track describes a greedy and exploitative attitude towards the desolation of a consumerist marketplace, while the second verse is much more optimistic and about how the system works. The chorus shows the song's real message perfectly about how reaching the limits of your abilities can lead to satisfaction even if it's not a particularly cheerful one. The refrain came from Tom's partner Rachel Owen who tried to reassure him when he was frustrated by the band's progress. It was uh, mm endless struggling i mean it was very much written during the, the block <laughs> it was about the only thing that made it through the block i sort of had a problem with c c coming coming from the context of, of of basically being in a band um and writing about personal experience um and one's own problems i suddenly sort of had had enough of it and i, I was reading a lot of sort of political stuff and thinking um, I don't understand why it is that these things are allowed to happen in our name and we just sort of just let it happen. Mm. Um, uh, and and I really had a problem with, with the fact that everybody was just resigned to that being the case, that, that somehow since the Berlin Wall fell, uh, capitalism in all its glorious forms is, is the only solution to all our problems and uh, screw everybody else, frankly, and uh, and that we're all just happy consumers and we, we really want that Renault and we really want that uh, mobile phone that you can program a melody on and ultimately will make us happy. 
The reverb heavy vocals, the thundering drum lines and distorted guitars create this very epic yet tense rock track. It's one of the most exciting and aggressive gut punches on the album which sounds simultaneously like the grunge inspired alt rock the band wanted to step away from as well as the sparse ambientness of the album. It's a track that sounds slightly out of place on the record but in a lot of ways also feels perfectly at home. It features some of York's best vocal performances on the album and some of the band's all-time best guitar riffs. It's followed by the similarly guitar-led In Limbo, although In Limbo is much jazzier than the heavy rock sound of Optimistic. Originally titled Lost at Sea, the track has a lot of dreamy imagery that depicts the track's themes of loneliness, confusion, and water. The inspiration for the song comes from the book Dante's Inferno, and much of the track describes the feeling of being stuck in limbo. Well, I mean, from my point of view, it was much more about um, uh, my, my partner, she is doing a PhD in... Um, Dante's Inferno, you know Dante's Inferno, um, and uh, we have this tape in our car, which is basically Dante's Inferno, <laughs> which is a good cheery drive. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, it's not Bruce Springsteen, is no, it? it ain't. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I just got really um, into all the um, aspects of limbo, the, the levels of hell, and because um, that's it's quite um, formative to the way that we all think about heaven and hell and so on. And the song was kicking around at the time, and it sounded it, once we'd started recording it, it sounded to me. Like some of the voice stuff on it really just sounds like the voices from Limbo, the voices that can't get out. Mm. Many have also found the feeling of being in limbo as being kind of a metaphor for writer's block or the sensation of losing one's sense of ego. The band spent nine months working on the track trying to get it to work well but kept feeling that they were similarly stuck in limbo when it came to making the song sound good. The track is very rhythmic with the jazzy drums, cross rhythm in the guitars and electric piano sounds scattered throughout. It builds into this incredibly noisy crescendo which was created by manipulating and distorting the band through a plug-in. Usage of dreamlike imagery like you're living in a fantasy blend incredibly well with the unearthly spacey sound of the track. It's one of the album's most understated tracks, but one that sucks you in like a trap door that opens. <laughs> The track Idiotech is a complete departure from the past two tracks, heading into a heavy IDM direction. The song came about when Greenwood recorded a 50 minute recording of improvisations played on a modular synthesizer. After listening through the recording, Tom took a 40 second section which he believed was pure genius and used it as the basic rhythm for the song. The main four chord phrase of the song was sampled by Greenwood from the song Mealed on Lays from Paul Lansky's 1976 album First Recordings Electronic Music. Music winners. The starting point for that was, was trying to build a drum machine out of very old style synthesizers, kind of using the same things that, that, that you know, I suppose the Roland technicians would have had in 1978 or whatever to decide how to make something sound like a snare drum out of white noise and how to create the sound of a, of a bass drum, a kick drum out of filters. Um, and so it was, it was like, we basically built a drum machine um, and I played a record on top at random and had a radio playing and, and was just trying to generate all this chaos over this drum pattern. And then Tom cut it into sections um, and, and, and ended up having a sample of the record I was playing, which is this uh, compilation of electronic composers. They had this um, competition in 1972 to see who was writing the best modern electric music in a classical style. And it's been a very interesting process because uh, we had to track, I wanted to track down the composer to tell him we'd done it and ask permission and stuff. And, and at that point he'd been, you know, 18, 19 and, and was in college. Right. And no one knew where he, what he was doing today. Um, and it turns out he's, he's a professor at Princeton. These sampled chords use the Tristan chord to emphasize the structure of sound rather than traditional tonal harmony. The song is characterized by its unique drum rhythms which are inspired by glitch music and are incredibly irregular. Although on the surface the drums sound like it possesses a simple repeating beat, the subtle parts of the rhythm set it apart. The rhythm in the drums and synthesizer phrase bounce between a 6-4 and a 4-4 beat, whereas Tom's vocals are mostly in 4-4 except for one line in the second chorus where he appears to sing in 5-4. The drums parallel the rhythm to the bass line of National Anthem, while the more animated and syncopated 
chord sequences of the track completely contrast the slow ambient nature of Tree Fingers. The song also contains heavy use of synthetic sounds sampled throughout including sweet pads, warps and different pitch clicks. In an interview with The Wire, Tom described the track as an attempt to capture that exploding beat sound when you're at a club and the PA is so loud you know it's doing damage. As well as this, Tom's vocals are heavily layered with a large emphasis on harmonization and double tracked vocals. Tom's melodies mirror the bass line to the national anthem, however is rhythmically sung at half the speed. The track's lyrics are incredibly paranoid, with the central image being of a nuclear holocaust with references to global warming spread throughout. Tom's vocals are the most aggressive, uneasy and expressive on the entire album with a very nervous sound to the delivery. The track has the incredibly dark and anxious sound but with a very dancey feel due to its fast pounding drums and speedy vocal delivery. The next song, Morning Bell, is in many ways a culmination of much of the album's sounds, blending the rockier sound of Optimistic with the chaotic sounds of the National Anthem and the subdued keyboard sounds of everything in its right place. It's led by a syncopated drum rhythm, Tom's falsetto heavy vocals and eerie guitar lines. While many interpret the song to be about breakup or divorce, Tom has stated that it was about living with a ghost. The song is led by a softly played organ which blends well with this great bass performance and heavily distorted eerie guitars. The whole track has this creepy and unnerving feel to it that I think works really well. Tom's lyrics really add to the darkness of the track with violent lyrics which include lines such as The album's final song, Motion Picture Soundtrack, had been previously recorded during the OK Computer sessions entirely on piano. An acoustic rendition by Tom was played for WHFS Radio in Rockville on April 10th, 1996, but according to Tom, the track had been around for years and was even written before Creep. However, taking influence from Tom Waits, Tom recorded the song on a harmonium pedal organ. Greenwood added samples of harps to give the atmosphere of a 1950s Disney movie soundtrack. I did it uh, because everyone was sort of saying, oh, you know, we should do this. And I was mucking around with it on this pump organ thing. And then that was that was the extent of my involvement and had absolutely no emotional uh, contact with it at all, you know. And Cosy and Johnny and Nigel were really, like, into it and they thought it was really great. And I was like, yeah, okay, well, I'm going home now. And I came back, you know, 24 hours later and, and Johnny had basically done all these harps and uh, uh, double basses on it. And it just sounded like, you know, I'd always wanted that song to be this big tragedy but actually it's it is supposed to be uh, a, a homage to disney you know it's basically sort of saying you know you've been sold a massive white lie um and uh, there's something essentially missing from your life but um it's essentially disney's fault that's what it's saying the song is thematically similar to Exit Music for a film from OK Computer, which was originally written for the soundtrack of Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. However, unlike that song, here the song tries to end positively and bring all loose ends of the album to a conclusion. The song's opening organ and harp sounds are very bright and ethereal, which contrasts the more explicit lyrics about cheap sex and sad films. The harp sounds are almost heavenly and parallel the lyrics of Tom painfully singing over sending into the afterlife. The album is bookended by the lyric, I will see you in the next life, which has been theorised to either be about committing suicide or saying goodbye to a loved one, neither of which have been confirmed by the band, leaving its final moments up to the listener's interpretations, a theme prevalent throughout much of the album. The track perfectly shows Johnny's love of the old and new by blending these classic cinematic sounds with a very modern sound. Tom's vocals are beautiful and soft and the instrumentation is some of the most emotionally powerful pieces on the record, dare I say that the band have ever written. The track is really beautiful yet haunting and emotional. As it leads into Untitled, the album's ambient outro, the power of the track lingers on. It makes you reflect not just on the album, but life in general and the finality of the end. 
The anticipation for Kid A's release was incredibly high, with Spin Magazine describing it as the most anticipated rock record since Nirvana's In Utero. Compared to previous records, the band minimised their involvement in promoting the album. They conducted very few interviews or photo shoots, released no singles or music videos, and didn't release any advanced copies for critics. However, instead, the band set to the internet to promote the album with an incredibly innovative marketing campaign that was years ahead of its time. Rather than making music videos, the band created short 20 second films set to the music which they called blips. These blips were shown on music channels and distributed online. It sounds very fast to say but it's just great having having direct contact with that many people without having to go through journalists and, and you know present company accepted radio stations as well you know <laughs> thank you and that, that um you know it's, it's obviously it's exciting and also i mean personally i find it i enjoy the fact that it's all still quite primitive and you know relatively slow and 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 low quality and you know we've done a few web broadcasts and i love the the the, the, the you know the nature of it it's going to be a shame when it becomes like tv it's nice that it's still like kind of pirate tv and and and, and pirate radio even so and it's something we can run ourselves and like a real radio station or a real TV. As well as this, the band basically invented online legal music streaming by creating an embeddable player called iBlip that would stream the album in full as well as give you additional content and could be updated with live tracks, band news, pre-ordered links and the blips. The iBlip player was released three weeks before the album's official release and was streamed more than 400,000 times. By September 13th, the album had been put onto Napster and was available pretty much everywhere. Despite this, the album was still a gigantic commercial success that no one was expecting from an album with no radio plays or music videos and one that had basically already been leaked into the world. It was one of the first albums from a major act to use the internet as a viable promotional tool. As well as this, Pitchfork's famous 10 out of 10 review of the album completely opened the possibilities of online music journalism, making things like this video a possibility. However, not every critic was kind to the album as them. Many, especially in the UK publications completely slated the album for removing itself from the rock world and supposedly badly trying to fit into the electronic world. The reaction in, in, in the UK has been strangely conservative in a way. Complaints about, you know, lack of melody and, you know, really quite surreal. They've reviewed it like a, you know, like a Travis record or something, like a, in that they, they want it to sound... They want a Travis record. In a way, yeah, <laughs> in a way. It's quite bizarre. You and know. there's nothing wrong with the Travis be fine. Yeah. Everyone but that's Travis, Travis right? Yeah. Five times platinum or whatever. I mean, it's right. great. I think the press that we've had in the UK I thought was entirely predictable because I think a lot of what the journalists were writing about was very much where our heads were at about 18 months ago when we started this recording project, you know. It was like a, a fear of uh, trying different things and also sort of clinging on to old things and and the expectations of continuing the guitar thing from the Benz and OK computer. And once you become, like, recognised and better known, you also become expected to do certain things. So I, I found I found the press entirely predictable in, in England, the fact that people were going, I don't under, what is this? What's going on? Because it wasn't like these journalists had spent 18 months with us in the studio going through the process. They had like 48 hours to listen to the record and if I was them I'd probably have to, to give the same kind of verdict as well. The album debuted at number one on the Billboard charts and was their first US top 20 album as well as the first number one album from a UK band in three years. However, by the next year the album had only sold 310,000 copies, less than a third of what OK Computer had sold. However, in the years since, it has gone on to be considered a modern classic, one of the greatest albums of the 2000s, and one of, if not Radiohead's all-time best. It sold over 3.5 million copies worldwide, is included in the 1001 Albums You Must Hear Before You Die book, and is ranked 67th on Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Albums of All Time. Three months after its release, they announced their next album, Amnesiac, which comprised of 11 songs completed during the Kid A sessions. Although being well received, it's still widely considered to be a large step down from Kid A and one of the band's weaker albums, but that's a story for another time. Happy birthday Kid A, one of the weirdest left turns in music history and one of my top three favourite albums of all time.
Good night. Thank you so much for coming.